1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. It's not only Father's Day today, it's also Juneteenth, which I think uh, is important that we recognize how important it was that the captives were set free in our country. And uh, we don't want to ever forget that. 1 Kings 19, beginning with verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elisha, or Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. What a dark time in the prophet's life. Just take me, Lord. Ahab, the 11th king of Israel, was the worst. And God says it himself in 1 Kings 16.30. It says, Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Instead of full dependence on God by his word, Ahab made ungodly alliances. He sought compromise and success through compromise. Instead of trusting in the God of the word, he made worldly alliances. Ahab married the daughter of a neighboring nation, the daughter of a king, the daughter of a priest of Baal, an ungodly worship of idols. Oh, the lure of success through compromise. The lure of being accepted by the culture. 
We have it today. Strong lure of the culture and to compromise in order to have success. Jesus preached in Matthew 7, 6, to not give that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and again turn and rend you. Jesus was saying, don't surrender that which is precious in order to attract the ungodly. He wasn't saying don't preach. He never said not to preach the word of God. Do it to everyone. But don't surrender the valuables in order to attract them. They don't appreciate them for one thing. And if you surrender the valuables, they will turn and destroy you. They will rend you if you do that. It happened in the nation of Israel. It will happen to us in the church of Jesus Christ today. I fear it is happening. Don't change anything in order to please the culture and the world. Don't change anything. Because those you are attracting with compromise will destroy you. The church is helpless without the whole armor of God without the pearls, without that which is holy. I like what Martin Luther said at a crucial time in church history. He said, if I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, Christ, However boldly, I may be professing Christ. There's some words there I hope you picked up on. I am not confessing Christ. However boldly, I may be professing Christ. I am not confessing him, no matter what these lips are doing. Jezebel had sway over the king, this ungodly bride that he had taken in order to compromise with evil. In 1 Kings 21, 25, it says, But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. I guess on Father's Day it's good that we see a woman was behind him being stirred up to this great evil, right? That's what the Bible says. Jezebel's wife stirred up. But don't lose the fact that the Bible says he sold himself. Sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah had stood his ground. Many of you have heard the, the account. Elijah had the fire of God come down from heaven. I love that account. Dousing the sacrifice with water and making it impossible for it to be lit except God from the fire of heaven lit it didn't he that's fun but after Elijah had all the prophets of Baal put to death his life was now going to be taken there was a price he stood up against this system of compromise The mountaintop experience in the chapter before wasn't enough to confront the struggle of the hour. Elijah was hearing those voices in his head. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. Did you hear it in verse 4? He said, I'm a failure. He himself went a day's journey. He left his servant there and went another day's journey into the wilderness and sat under the only shade he could find under a juniper tree. And there he requested that he might die. Notice he didn't take his own life. He trusted in the Lord, but he said, Lord, please take my life. It's enough. Take away my life. I am no better than my father's. I am a total failure. I'm not getting things done. And although I fear Lauren Daigle is in danger of casting pearls before swine, I couldn't get her song out of my head this week as I was, or last week as I was preparing for this message. I keep fighting voices in my head that say I'm not enough. 
Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. And then her song makes the contrast. The voices in her head with God's voice. You say I am loved. You say I am strong. You say I am yours. And I believe. I believe. The question today is what are the loudest voices in our head? You've all heard the old childhood saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie, isn't it? Damage done by sticks and stones will heal, but the wrong messages heard are far more difficult to heal. Almost universal, isn't it? As my dad says on page 61 of his book, Salvation in Christ, Perhaps all Christians in some ways and degrees are victims of emotional and psychological damage suffered during the course of their lives. Some of these may be with them for the remainder of their time on earth, even as they were, are continuing in Christ. Keep hearing voices in my head that say I'm not enough. The most powerful words are those spoken in relationship by God's design. The greater the relationship by God's design and purpose for good, the greater the power for evil. The greater the importance of the relationship by God's design, the greater the power for evil. It's an incredible principle. It's an inescapable principle. I heard some of the, these thoughts in our brother Jerry's prayer over the offering this morning. As all of us are celebrating our fathers, he's reminded of what he didn't have and how my mother's verse is true. When my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. And he's faithful. Those voices are still in my head. I'm not enough. That which by God's design offers the greatest potential for power, for good, threatens the greatest power for evil. I see it played out all the time. Free will offers God's heaven. Reciprocal love relationship is what he's after. That's the eternal purpose of God, to love and be loved by free will. It threatens a hell of permanent destruction and separation. Necessarily, the one that represents the greatest possibility and potential threatens the greatest tragedy and harm. It's a principle. If you're going to offer something that has the potential to do great good, at the same time, it necessarily threatens great harm. The parent-child relationship holds the power of such great good of the, and of the deepest hurt. The marriage between a man and a woman because of its design for good threatens the most harm. What did Elijah need to confront the power of wrong voices in his head? What did he need? If we'll read on, we'll find out what God thought he needed. 1 Kings 19.5, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and then he laid down again. He got some rest that he needed. The angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. Because there's a great journey ahead of you. I still need you. And he arose and did eat and drink. And he went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights. Under horror of the mountain of God. We need the bread of heaven, don't we? We need the living water. We need the focus on God's word. We need rest. God has given us a Sabbath for that reason. We need. A day to hear 
the Word of God and to feed on Him, and we need to rest. He needed those things. And then we need to be reminded of this most powerful voice of all in our lives. There's one that is more powerful than any voice ever. Look at verse 9. And he came thither into a cave and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenants, thrown down thine altars. They've slain the prophets with the sword and I'm the only one left. And they're coming for me. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind, rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, a great shaking of the earth. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, a consuming mighty fire. He had seen a mighty fire come down and consume that sacrifice, hadn't he? But the Lord wasn't in the fire. After the fire, still small voice. Still small voice. The power of the voice of the word of God. I love that account where Jesus, after his resurrection, his disciples, they had had some problems, didn't they? And they had messed up. They were out fishing again. They were casting the net all day, weren't they? Jesus came to the shore and said, Guys, cast on the other side. Cast on the other side. You're fishing on the wrong side of the boat, guys. No, Peter could be fishing on the wrong side of the boat, couldn't he? He denied his Lord three times and he went out and wept bitterly. And what did Jesus say to him? He's cooking a little meal on the shore. He said, come and dine. Come and dine. The master says, come and dine. Come and eat. Feed your souls, men. And quit fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Start fishing on the, this side of the boat. And we're going to catch a great bounty of fish. And they did. God gives instructions, including in verse 16, to go for Elijah to go and anoint Elisha, the one that would take his place, the man who will be there for the next generation. And by the way, verse 18, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which has not kissed him. By the way, you're not the only one. In fact, there are 7,000 in Jerusalem. You think you're the only one, and you're not. Wake up. Anoint the next generation. Move forward. Stop fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Stop listening to those voices in your head. What was God teaching Elijah? It's not about the heroic moments. That the greatest work is done. It's not in the fire from heaven. It's not from the earthquakes and all the fireworks. It's in the day to day with the little tiny small voice. Daddies. It's not about the heroics. It's about a day to day voice. It's in the heart of the voice of truth in your day to day life. Whether you're feeling it or not. God told Isaiah about this most powerful voice in Isaiah 30, beginning of verse 20. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and water of affliction, there's bread and water again, ye shall not thy teachers, yet shall thy teachers not be removed. Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand, when you turn to the left, there's that bread and water, rest and strength and the word of God and the voice saying, follow me, go this way. Life's not about the hero moments of the movies. It's about the day to day listening 
and learning. It's about God, family, church, country, and world. Put those in order. God and family. Think about the power of God's word to confront so many wrong messages. Now think about the wonderful power of earth's most powerful voices joining with God's voice. What if earth's most powerful voices work in harmony with the most powerful voice in heaven? That's what God wants. In league with the Almighty. Proverbs 22, 6. You've heard it many, many times. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he was, is old, he will not depart from it. Not depart from the training. He still has free will. Those voices will still be in his head. He'll keep hearing voices in his head that say God is the way. Follow it. Follow it. That's the power of both voices working together instead of apart and at each other and in opposition to each other. The voices in harmony are wonderful and powerful. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy. He's in heaven now, but I just thank God that the voices I heard in my head were good voices from Daddy and from God. They were working in harmony together in great power, great power. Young Timothy, that instrument of God so early, Paul reminded him in 2 Timothy 1, Five, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned, that means not fake, real, authentic faith that is in you, Timothy, which was first in your grandmother and then in your mother. Their names were Lois and Eunice. And he names them by name. And is in you also. You keep hearing voices in your head, don't you? And they're great voices from grandma and from mom. Apparently not from dad, I guess, because dad's not mentioned there. Powerful voices. If we could add our peers, what? Someone was, I'm not going to get personal because somebody was reading a social post by one of our teenagers that went to camp. But he was rejoicing in how good God is and how good camp was. A teenage boy, athletic boy. And his friends were cheering him on on social media from what I was shown. How beautiful that is. What if the peer voices are the voices that are with God? What if you're a friend? You're a friend of somebody who loves the Lord and you love the Lord and your voices together are saying the same thing that God says. How powerful it is when peers are saying the same thing God is saying. Powerful. I look back on my life and I thank God for peers that were saying the same thing God was saying in my life. I kept hearing voices in my head that said God is good enough. Don't be foolish and go the wrong way. Friends cheering me on. Parents cheering me on. Mom thinking the best of me always, even when she was wrong. The power of those earthly voices. Where two or three are gathered together in his name, God joins them in what power there is where two or three are gathered in the name of the Lord. Those voices get together. How powerful that is. How important church is. How important fathers are. What if the voices of earth join the heavenly voices? What if the many voices in my head teach the ways of God? What a blessing. What a heritage. And all those wrong voices drowned out by the word of God. Drowned out by those who join God and speaking into my life. And saying things to me that are in harmony with the things of God. You are a blessing to me, all of you. You, are, you speak the words of God with me and to me. 
It's powerful. I thank you for that. I don't want to cloud the issue. The most powerful voices on earth are mom and dad, husband and wife. What if they join with God? What if they join with God? Say the same thing. Power that can overcome all those other voices in my life. I had them, but I had the powerful voice of God, and I had those who loved him in my life. Made all the difference in the world. Thank you, dads. Thank you that in some churches, Father's Day is not populated very well. Because dad wants to go to the golf course, or dad wants to go to the lake, or dad wants to do this. Thank you, fathers, that dad wanted to come to church today. We thank God for you. I want us to sing. Let's stand.